Hello, and welcome to a special report on the continuing mission of the Hyperion Shuttle. The shuttle made a flyby of the moon a few days ago and subsequently made a slight correction burn in order to make sure that it was headed into a trajectory that would take it into the atmosphere of the Earth in order to aerobrake and also made another correction burn in order to match in order to match inclinations with the Titan station. On its way back, it also made a finer inclination correction burn using its RCS. Recall that it accidentally decoupled its booster pack and so could not use the booster pack for any subsequent maneuverings. So it has that uh, problem, but the calculation was that a number of passes through Earth's atmosphere would allow it to break sufficiently to rendezvous with Titan Station using solely its RCS. That's a little bit more uh, tedious than the process if it did not have to make so many passes and instead used the booster pack to decelerate but it is still considered reasonably safe at this point. It made its uh, first uh, re-entry into the atmosphere on day 6, uh, 9 hours and 34 minutes and 53 seconds into the mission. At that point uh, it was at 150 kilometers and traveling at 10,573 meters per second relative to the surface. In order to maximize deceleration, aero brakes were extended. But it turned out that uh, the crew learned something about those aero brakes, as we will soon see. Uh, at a certain point, the the force of the aero brakes, the drag that they cause, uh, started pushing the nose down unacceptably, and. Also, there was a slight malfunction in the brakes in that they were unable to retract them. And so they remained extended for a period of time as the crew tried to figure out another way to bring them down. And you can see the brakes are actually forcing the nose of the craft down uh, during this first re-entry. However, the re-entry was very shallow. The, the periapsis there uh, not lower than uh, 70 kilometers, which is uh, which is reasonably high and uh, does not produce significant heating on the surfaces of the shuttle. All the surfaces of the shuttle can withstand the heat produced at this altitude. The main issue was to make sure that they could get the brakes working properly, and uh, they eventually figured out how to retract them. You can see there a periapsis of uh, 72 kilometers. Uh, very safe for the shuttle on its first pass. In fact, every subsequent pass would have a lower periapsis than that as they tried to uh, speed up the process. Uh, this first pass brought the This first pass ended at 9 hours and 38 minutes into the sixth day. At that point, the shuttle was recorded at an altitude of 121 kilometers going 9,798 meters per second, AP apoapsis at uh, 30,000 kilometers, and it is now, as you can see, re-approaching the Earth. The second entry occurred at 6 days, 18 hours, and 18 minutes. So this was a long process for the crew as uh, uh, the time between between those two passes was approximately eight and a half hours. But of course every subsequent pass would be quicker. Here you can see it passing over uh, Colombia, the Panama Canal there, Panama, Costa Rica. Naturally this is a simulated view and part of the problem with with getting the video together was to match the simulation with the vocal recordings and also the the in-cockpit views as you can see here. Uh, so and uh, 
the, all the data had to be uh, crunched by our simulators to bring you these these views of what occurred. Again, minor heating on the surfaces. This time, uh, the air brakes had been extended earlier, retracted before 80 kilometers in altitude, and that uh, was deemed a safe way to go. And on the second pass, there were no uh, uh, substantial problems. There was the use of RCS in order to keep the nose up and part of the reason that a multi-pass approach was used was to conserve RCS very critical as it turned out uh, that uh, RCS was uh, conserved and so only a bit of RCS was necessary in order to keep the nose up for only a brief time during the re-entry process we're not going to belabor the point as the shuttle made numerous passes in order to uh, do its air braking and it turned out to not to be uh, too tedious a process as the time between the first air break and the time of the final air break was uh, a day and, a, and two hours. So one day, two hours, the final air break would occur at, at seven days, 11 hours and 28 minutes. But we will show you some, some footage as the as the approach taken on each air brake was slightly different each time and uh, this was in order to in order to uh, test the shuttle's capabilities and its aerodynamics and to get more data more data on its flight profile for future missions so uh, the timing of the extension of the air brakes was uh, changed the periapsis was changed uh, the lowest periapsis was 63 kilometers. You can see uh, four different approaches here. The sequence goes upper left, upper right, uh, lower right, lower left. And so the lower left uh, view was the, was the last one out of these four passes. And uh, as you can see, of course, the lower left one has the least amount of uh, heat generated. And it was also also relatively shallow compared to the ones on the right. In each case, a little bit more RCS had to be used. It's worth talking about the RCS tank on the shuttle at this point, I think, as the shuttle has a very large tank. It is an uh, a converted S2 mom propellant tank, it is uh, actually now a service module tank in order to make it lighter. Uh, so it is a service module tank that carries all of the fuel and that is MMH uh, monomethyl hydrazine and uh, nitrogen tetroxide. And uh, the thrusters all burn with uh, reasonable efficiency though not the maximum possible that uh, we have seen. So, the moderate efficiency from the actual RCS thrusters, but now as we see the final pass into the atmosphere, uh, the total volume is approaching about 2,000 liters of each of the fuels. So a very substantial amount, in fact, in fact, a large proportion of the shuttle's mass is uh, is in the fuel for the RCS system, and that is why it was able to generate so much delta V all on its own. Here you see that they are firing the RCS thrusters in order to lift their orbit, as it was projected that they would actually be re-entering too too deeply and might be threatened into a forced landing if they did not do this uh, correction burn. So you can see them lifting up the apoapsis a little bit on this final pass. The periapsis uh, going lower was not a concern since that could be corrected at apoapsis and lifted up back into a proper orbit. Also the shuttle was behind the station at this point so it had to get into the lower orbit anyway. Here you see it making its uh, lifting burn. Uh, 
This burn occurred at apoapsis to lift its periapsis. Its periapsis before this was at uh, negative 67 kilometers uh, to about negative 74 kilometers. This uh, recovery burn, if you will, uh, took 125.8 meters per second, occurred at 7 days, 11 hours, and 43 minutes into the mission. And it brought its, uh, its orbit back up into a safe orbit. At least safe enough for a quick transfer to the station. Following this, the, the shuttle would have to make a rendezvous burn. The rendezvous burn was projected to be 60 meters per second, but the shuttle had to make a few rounds of the planet in order to catch up to Titan Station. And, and simply catching up to the station uh, required almost 10 hours. So the rendezvous burn occurred at 7 days, 21 hours, and 20 minutes into the station, uh, into the mission. And so quite a long mission for Guzming and Shelby Kerman, though though considering it was a moon mission, uh, not too long actually. And of course the supplies were replete. They had uh, many hundreds of days worth of supplies. That was not an issue. And since the cabin of the shuttle was meant for six people, they had plenty of room. Here you can see the rendezvous burn. Again, uh, 60 meters per second. The remaining uh, fuel for the RCS after this burn was 110 liters of MMH. And also 138 liters of N204. That was a fairly tight amount considering the shuttle would also have to do its uh, deceleration burn in order to rendezvous with Titan Station. Um, this rendezvous burn brought it within one kilometer of the station actually, though it wouldn't actually be able to slow down in time in order to get that distance. It would actually uh, take uh, long enough to slow down that it would it would end up uh, at about 1.4 kilometers within the safe zone of the station though, so... There was some concern about that. Uh, there was talk about... Talk about possibly deploying the tug and using the tug to bring the shuttle in. Here you see the deceleration burn to match velocities with the station. Quite a long burn this time, and it used almost all of the fuel. The remaining MMH after this, for instance, was only 19 liters. But that was deemed barely enough for uh, Guzming and Shelby to bring it in themselves without the use of the tug, but though the tug was on standby just in case they needed it. This would have to be very carefully done. Failure on the first docking attempt uh, would cause a lot of problems if the shuttle could not then move out of the way of the station enough to allow the tug to slip in and attach to the shuttle's docking port. In that case, the tug would have to probably use its claw to bring the shell out and uh, that would perhaps damage some of the shuttle, delicate instruments and everything. So. So quite a lot of uh, calculations being done and cautionary notes being sent to the crew about how they approach the station. But they decided to continue without the tug and here you can see the approach to the station. The views you see here are a mix of uh, simulated views as well as uh, camera drone views. The closer we get to Titan Station the more it is the camera drones. In a moment, we should see the onboard camera view from the shuttle. Ah, there we go. And so this is the shuttle's own view of the station as it approaches. Uh, quite a nice view. And in fact, uh, the station, the station's own camera was also able to pick up the shuttle very clearly. And so we'll eventually get a view of that as well. Here, the shuttle is turning around as it will have to lead with its docking port, which is on its tail. Designers neglected to put a camera facing backwards on the shuttle and that will have to be fixed. Here you can see the station doing a minor one axis 15 degree turn. Uh, this is sped up a little bit. It was uh, much slower than this in fact. And 
The reason for this is uh, to ensure that the shuttle would be able to approach on its first pass and uh, this was an emergency measure in order to uh, make up for the fact that the shuttle was short on RCS fuel. It would not normally be done like this. And here we can see the station's own camera turning to capture the shuttle. The shuttle had to uh, do a minor roll in order to line up with the station. And there it was all lined up. The crew was excited to finally be able to get to their destination, though uh, still cautious of course. And here you can see a very good simulated view of the approach. The angle somewhat distorts the relationship between the two bodies, but it's still a magnificent uh, look at it. And there you see the shuttle closer to the station. And here's a view from one of the camera drones. The station's camera drones are always uh, focused uh, mostly on the station. They have trouble picking up approaching craft as such. Uh, so they have to be positioned so that the craft are in sight. Uh, otherwise they, they always have a focus on the station. This is the station's own camera. Excellent view this time and in uh, full daylight. Of course, uh, with the pilots uh, doing the docking instead of the automated systems definitely wanted this to be in daylight. Following this docking of course Guzming and Shelby will transfer onto the station and the shuttle will also transfer as much uh, food, water and oxygen as it can to the station. Uh, the station doesn't have too much uh, empty space and hasn't actually used much of its stores but whatever can be transferred from the shuttle to the station will be will be uh, transferred and of course any waste will be transferred back to the shuttle to bring it back down. Here the shuttle is well within 50 meters and uh, closing at approximately 0.15 meters per second it will slow down uh, just before it reaches about 10 meters and at that point it will be at 0.05 meters per second. This is a camera drone view. You'll notice that there is very little chatter between the crew of the station and crew of the shuttle and that is because the crew of the station did not want to uh, interfere with uh, the focus of Guzming and Shelby Kerman and so they would uh, just entrust that the shuttle crew knew what they were doing and of course uh, while the camera views would be able to suggest certain things about the approach. Uh, they aren't uh, conclusive and so the station crew was cautious about giving guidance on this one though perhaps in the future that will be changed as it turned out the shuttle crew was a little bit off. At first it seemed like they were a little well, bit too low but as as they got to this point it was uh, becoming clear that they were actually going to be approaching a little bit high they slowed and uh, attempted to see if the docking port magnetism would be able to compensate for that and so uh, coming in very slowly here as you can see but uh, at this point definitely high. <laughs> and they confirmed that uh, the docking port magnetism would not be able to figure this out.
And with that, it simply stopped inches away from the port. A uh, minor pitch control move was done by the shuttle crew. And that led to eventual contact. So uh, a simple little uh, tug on the control stick and uh, contact was made and the shuttle was stopped. And so, uh, this is the successful docking of the Hyperion shuttle to Titan Station after a somewhat longer mission than was originally intended as the shuttle had to make multiple passes into the atmosphere instead of using its booster pack in order to slow down. But uh, no uh, serious difficulties here as the shuttle crew was able to transfer to the station and the shuttle will subsequently make its way back down to the surface in yet another re-entry test. Uh, the test will definitely bring it to uh, an ocean splashdown. Uh, there's not uh, going to be any attempt to land it on a runway just yet as we are continuing to see its aerodynamics and how it interacts with the atmosphere. It produces quite a lot of lift and so there's a lot of uh, concern that maybe the wings need to be shortened up in order to actually make it uh, land properly. But then again, I also concern that if the wings were smaller, that it would not be able to maintain its pitch in order to dissipate the heat using the reflective surfaces on the bottom of the shuttle. And of course that would endanger the shuttle entirely. The goal for now then is simply to make sure that the shuttle actually is retrieved and uh, once they have more confidence in the ability to bring it to a desired location then they will start landing it at runways. Uh, for now though, everything looks good for the Hyperion Shuttle and Titan Station and especially for Guzming and Shelby Kerman who get to relax after the long trip around the moon. And so we thank you for watching. This has been a presentation of the Hyperion Mission from the Elegant Design Bureau and this is the EDB signing off.